Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The goal of this segment is to take the first steps toward mastery of a second feature of the water problem. It's the, the feature that pertains to pH and buffers, two terms you may or may not be familiar with, but you'll be very familiar with them by the time we finish this segment. So let's remember the context. Biochemistry is the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle that pulls together the chemical world and the biological world. And as we said, the fundamental solvent of virtually all biochemistry is water. And so we need to understand its properties to understand biochemistry. Moreover, in a very real sense, water is itself a biological or biochemical molecule. So the lessons we learn about water are not just lessons about the solvent, but lessons that can be applied directly to biological molecules. You'll get a, you got some feel for that last time, the last water segment, the segment on uh, s solubility and, and uh, uh, the hydrophobic effect and so on. You'll get a, another perspective on that today as we look at the properties of water as an ionizable substance, as a substance that can function as an acid or a base. So let's go back to this uh, hydrogen bonded pair of molecules that we used, water molecules that we used so extensively in the last lecture. And now let's look at another trick they can play in addition to hydrogen bonding. So here are the two oxygens in the molecules, just to orient you. The hydrogens you can see is the letters H in the diagram. Remember again that oxygen is very electronegative. It pulls electrons away from the hydrogens and into the orbits around oxygen. That allows the hydrogen bond to form that you can see here as a dotted line. I've turned it green here to emphasize it. And then next to it is the covalent bond in um, the hydrogen to water. However, because the this central hydrogen that you see here is partly denuded of electrons, it's relatively easy for that uh, hydrogen bond, covalent bond flare pair to flip like this. So let me cycle that for you again. So this is a normal pair of water molecules. This is a, uh, uh, now a pair of water molecule derivatives in which the hydrogen ion of one uh, water molecule has now become covalently bonded or like a covalent bond to the other. And as you can well imagine, now that, that creates a charge separation. The, uh, um, oxygen, the water molecule on the right that's picked up an extra hydrogen uh, ion is now has a net positive charge, and the one on the left that's lost that hydrogen ion has a net negative charge. This, uh, as you might imagine, this charge separation creates a, a, an energetically unfavorable condition. So in fact, there's it, it a limited extent to which this ionization of water occurs, but it occurs enough to matter. And that's going to be our focus over the next few minutes. To so first understand that ionization process, then to understand how we can manipulate it, and then to understand how it applies not just to water, but in fact to biological molecules which do very similar things as well as interacting with these ionic forms of water in some really important ways. So the ion at the left that's lost a um, uh, hydrogen ion is referred to as the hydroxide ion and is symbolized OH minus. You've probably run across it before. You're going to see that symbol a lot. The ion at the right is technically what's called a hydronium ion. That is, it's a complete water molecule plus an extra hydrogen ion. But for simplicity, we often don't talk about hydronium ions. We often talk about hydrogen ions uh, as if they are free-floating entities. Of course, as an isolated proton, it's not going to roam around uh, 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 free of association with electrons. But to a first approximation, we can think of hydrogen ion concentration. What we really mean is hydronium ion concentration. Okay? So we'll speak about hydrogen ion concentration uh, when we're talking about the equations and the quantitative treatment of this issue. The next uh, point to uh, grasp is that this ionization of water is very predictable. We can quantitatively predict it with some very simple equations, which then gives us the power to understand what's going on with molecules as a function of bulk hydrogen ion concentration, something we can measure with macroscopic instruments, as you'll see over the next few minutes. So this is, again, our uh, two pair of ions. Uh, in which you now have a hydrogen ion or a hydronium ion on the right and the hydroxide ion on the left. This is, a e this is the equilibrium between those things. Water is in equilibrium with the hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion as we talk about them in chemical equations as we mentioned a moment ago. And notice that again in the equation I'm not writing out hydronium ion to keep it simple. I'm just writing out hydrogen ion as we almost always will do. This is of course an equilibrium constant, something you should be beginning to be comfortable with. Now, we talked about it ex uh, extensively in the earlier segment on thermodynamics and the energetics of, of uh, biochemical reactions. Uh, but as it turns out, as you'll see in just a moment, the fraction of water molecules that actually disassociate 
into hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion is so small that the hydrogen ion concentration basically, uh, I'm sorry, the water concentration, that is the denominator in this fraction, essentially doesn't change no matter what we do to hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion concentrations. So it's inconvenient to work with this more cumbersome expression, and instead we work with what's sometimes called the ion product constant, which is the, uh, a slightly derived constant, which is the hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, and that turns out to be a constant as well in practice in the real world of biochemical reactions. But notice at right the value of that equal equilibrium constant, 10 to the minus 14th. So this is now a not a very efficient process. This reaction that you see uh, boxed in gray here is way toward the left. Most water molecules are intact. Only a few dissociate into hydroxide or hydrogen ion concentrations. Let's quantify that statement for a moment. Let's move these two equations that were these two uh, descriptions that we're going to use to uh, understand uh, ionization of water quantitatively to the top and add some other quantitative details. So it's conventional to call the, a state in which the hydrogen ion concentration equals the hydroxide ion concentration to call that neutrality. And uh, therefore, each of those, since the ion product constant is 10 to the minus 14, and the product and each of the product of these two is 10 to the minus 14, each of them, if, since they're equal, must be 10 to the minus 7 molar. Okay. So again, very simple. If you're uncomfortable multiplying exponents, uh, remember that you add exponents to multiply them. So 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the minus 7 equals 10 to the 14. I'm sorry, 10 to the minus 14. Okay. All right. But talking, uh, using exponential notation can be convenient in certain circumstances, but it's very inconvenient when we're talking about hydrogen ion concentrations in biochemical uh, reactions. So in fact, we've developed, a, a biochemists uh, generations ago developed a simple convention. And, uh, and I'm sorry, before I tell you that convention, let me emphasize what's important boxed in red here. At neutral pH, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 7. That's one-tenth micromolar. So you might imagine that the hydrogen and hydroxide ion concentrations, while they form, are at such low concentrations that we don't really care about them. As you'll see over the next few minutes, that nothing could be further from the truth. Even the very low concentrations at which these ions exist, they interact profoundly with biological molecules. So in fact, even though it's one-tenth micromolar at neutrality, we care a lot about the hydrogen ion concentration. So watch for that as it emerges over the next few minutes after we finish our quantitative treatment. Okay, so let me come back now to this convention of describing uh, hydrogen ion concentration uh, as um, uh, not as an exponent, but as a negative log of the exponent, or what's called pH. pH, again, now is just the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Since the hydrogen ion is more important, we generally describe it uh, the the um, status of uh, water in a reaction as a function of hydrogen ion concentration, but we could just as easily describe it as a function of hydro uh, hydroxide ion concentration. We could calculate a pOH if we wanted to, very straightforward, and remember that the pH and the pOH must always add up to what? 14. So in fact, at neutrality, the pH is 7, but the pOH is 7 too. We won't worry about pOH anymore. It's virtually never used for reasons that will emerge over the next couple of, of uh, segments, we're much more interested in hydrogen ion and its interaction with biological molecules. So we'll focus on hydrogen ion concentration and describe things in terms of the hydrogen ion concentration, or specifically pH. So let's get a little more comfortable with using pH here. So a moderately acidic solution, that is one with an elevated hydrogen ion concentration, might, be, might have a hydrogen ion concentration of millimolar, 10 to the minus 3 molar. What would its pH be? Three, I'm sure you can see. What would the hydroxide ion concentration be under those conditions? 10 to the minus 11 molar, since the ion product constant has to be always 10 to the minus 14 molar. Okay, Let's take a moderately basic solution. So a moderately acidic solution might be like vinegar that you'd use in, uh, in uh, salad uh, dressing, for example. A moderately basic solution might be a mild solution of baking soda, something like that. And that might have a hydrogen ion concentration now of 10 to the minus 9 molar. The hydroxide ion concentration would be what? 10 to the minus 5 molar. So you're elevating the hydroxide ion concentration as you do.